the striated component still changes even after the age of 16 years. And this may be due, perhaps, to changes in the activity pattern of the underlying sources, since it is known that from the age of about three years till puberty, a rearrangement takes place of the synaptic context in the visible cortex. For older children, also extra striated activity starts to contribute to the pattern on CTP. And they have shown you that the contribution of extra striated activity becomes especially apparent for stimulation with the left half of the visible field. And this is in accordance with the delayed myelination process of the extra striated areas in the left hemisphere with respect to the right hemisphere. There's also the asymmetry found for, the, for right versus left visible stimulation supports the hypothesis that the myelination process is responsible for the development of extra stride activity in the pattern on CTP. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your presentation. This paper is open for discussion. Start the discussion. I, I just have a question of information. How well, how much error variance do you have remaining in your after, in your source analysis with the children, <laughs> as opposed to um, the adults? <coughs> error variance. I mean, what, what kind of variance are you left over with in terms of the things when you do your source analysis? <laughs> children, so you get much nicer responses in children than in adults. Not my profession. <laughs> We've done some work on premature babies and trying to find out where the pattern reversal and also flash responses were used. We found that in the case of premature babies, we managed to get some sort of response at um, about minus eight weeks if we take zero point as being at the 40 week level. That's when we started to get the first amount of signals. Have you tried using flash and pattern reversal, or are you just con concentrating on pattern reversal? Yes, I'm only doing pattern yeah. on CTPs. What's the youngest that you've looked at? I have been looking for, I have been doing source localization on children from six years of age. Right. Yeah? But I can understand what you are saying because. At least, I don't know that much about it, but the maturation of the visual yeah. cortex starts before birth, at least in the stride areas, and in the extra stride areas, it starts beyond. Yeah, where, where were you putting your electrodes? Is it um, all over the visual cortex, or just on three or four different locations? Mainly on the occiput. There's a grid of electrodes, of 24 electrodes, on the occiput, yeah? Right. Yeah. And a link chain bipolar? Yeah. So that was on a link chain bipolar type electrodes or? No, reference is frontal. Right, fine. Thanks. Next question. No questions. No questions anymore. Um, we can conclude this uh, session. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we, we have still one session to go this afternoon, tonight. Uh, I think. We should be back here in 15 minutes after the coffee break. Is that okay with you?
does is the waves are too difficult. If you have 20 or 30 or 60 or 128 waves, then you cannot distinguish one wave from the other. You have too many peaks and troughs, and so you need really the maps. Uh, I am sorry to tell you that we don't use MEG, but what, we never know what the future will bring to our hospital. So first of all, I will show you some data to get you used to our topographic displays. Uh, the, one of the, the most of the P300 slides I presented uh, last year in Japan for the P300 club. They even have a club for P300 examiners. A very interesting researchers in P300 only. Now I will show you some normal Amsterdam subject with its EEG data. Oh, what happens now? The slide doesn't go in. Okay, here we have a display of EEG frequency analysis and here you see a map in which you see here the nose and the left ear, the right ear, the back of the head and you see depicted in the scheme the electrode placements, the 1020 system we use 21 electrodes as you can see. Here we have a frequency analysis which you can see on the uh, upper left in 10 is 10 hertz and you can see on the right side, now you can't see it anymore, the arbitrary amplitude scale. This is the same person, 10 hertz again, eyes opened, F former slide was eyes closed, alpha rhythm, you see here the depression of the alpha when the eyes are opened. Very familiar to you, but I show you these maps to get you used to the, the way we look at the data. This is the slide I referred to before. You see here at 10.5 hertz mu rhythm, the person has his eyes opened and you see on both parietal areas beautiful amplitudes, uh, augmentation of the mu rhythm. When you move one, when this person moves one hand, you see if he moves the left hand, you see a not only a depression of the amplitude on the right side, but also on the left side. This is perhaps what, what is also uh, happening in your experiments, that there is both hemispheres active. And the same happens when you use the, r uh, the right hand, you see a depression on the left side and also on the right side. Now this is a display, which you can hardly see, I, su I suppose now, of uh, event uh, somatosensory evoc potentials. And what the meaning of this slide is, that is that if you use this 1020 system and you stimulate the first digit you get a maximum over the contralateral C3 electrode and when you use when you stimulate the fifth digit you get this maximum here so we can make even in the 1020 system we have a resolution that is possible to distinguish between the the first and the third finger and the activity of the third finger is somewhere in the middle and this is the uh, P47 of the median nerve. Well, this is not so very clear, I know. This is a visual evoke potential, of which you see here the familiar time trace and two or three wave shapes when uh, the pattern reversals are used, and this is the same thing for flash. Normal topography, as you all know. Here we go again. Okay. Now we are getting into waves and wave shapes and the reference. And all reference is always very important. And the reference is the same as the sea level for our maps, in which you have the zero level, the mountain is the positive, and the valley is the negative. So the thing you see here is the, the reference that is depicting, in fact, the zero level of the landscape. And it doesn't matter which reference to use, if you use voltage maps, time maps, then you best use the average reference. Of course the reference is important when you use only wave shapes, but this is the advantage of mapping. You don't, 
let you be fooled about places of different references when you use the average reference. And you will see that the average reference is for EVO potential, in fact, the only one way to look at uh, data. And we can make use of this later in, a diff uh, in another calculation for finding the best latencies of these EPs in certain windows. So if you have <coughs> a lot of channels and you have a lot of data points per channel, you end up with a huge amount of data. And you need a way to suppress this number. And Scrandis and Lehmann found a beautiful way to do this by uh, the global field power method. And this is a very nice method to give a real data reduction. Instead of these 5,000 so many numbers, you end up with one, in the time frame, of course, you are looking at, one latency number, one uh, coordinate for the most positive activity in the map and one uh, coordinate for the negativity, the trough. And this works like this, assuming that you, if you do this, you assume that at the moment of most, let's say, of the uh, activity of most neurons, th that that is the moment in time you want to look at, that the latency of an evil potential is the moment in time of in which most of the neurons are active. If you assume this, then you can use this method very nice. And this, the method is calculating the steepness of the landscape, the hilliness, as Lehmann says, of the landscape. At the moment in time when the hilliness is the largest, you have the largest global field power, the spatial standard deviation. And this is how to calculate this. We go quickly over to the result, and you see here in a typical result of a P300, the wave that is depicting for every moment in time the number of the global field power. So that means that at the, this t momentary time, at 356 milliseconds, the steepest gradients in the map are, are present. And if you switch over from this wave at this time, uh, uh, at this moment in time, to the map, you will get a map with only two things in it which are important to describe the map, the maximum positivity here and the maximum negativity somewhere else. And you can do this for all points in time, of course, and all points that are important in these waves. So this is a very nice and easy method because this is unambiguous. It is not dependent on somebody who is looking at the wave shape and say, well, it might be here, or somebody else says, no, on the different wave shape, it is over there, it's unambiguous, it's taken care of all waves at the same time, and it gives you a nice indication on what's happening. So what we do is, in the next examples that we will show you, I will show you the data on maximal global field power. Now we go into P300, we, our paradigm is very simple, in fact, we have also very difficult paradigms, but in the end we didn't understand what we were measuring anymore. So we keep it simple by giving non-target uh, stimuli of 1000 Hz and target stimuli at random in 1025 at uh, 2000 Hz. And we will measure 30 samples after a target and 150 to 180 samples depending on the random after the non-target. You're very kind to me looking foolish with this hanger. So this is an example of a non-target. <coughs> this is the familiar wave shapes for you. This is the moment in time that we found uh, the maximum field power for the target, and it is 288 milliseconds. You see we have a very flat landscape. If you look at the right here, you see that the scale is from plus 15 microvolt to minus 15 and that the green yellowish thing is zero so the landscape is kind of flat here while at the moment of the p3 you see a little later it is that there is a maximum at pc and a negativity in the front so this is the the way we look at p3s and now we have three kind of things that you could look at you can look at latencies and you can look at uh, latency differences from normal and patients, and you can look at topography of the positive uh, of the peak, 
uh, you can look at the topography of the trough. So you have three components to look at to decide if something is normal or not. So we looked at uh, about 65 normal subjects and then we, the study that was uh, performed together with Michel van der Berg, who uh, wrote a, a student thesis on that. And uh, 60, uh, 45 of these uh, subjects were, uh, had good enough data to perform the averages on. So what we looked at is the different components. Here we look at the N100 component, which gives you here the latencies where you use the left index finger to make the, the response for the target or the right index finger to make a response. You can do also counting. We measure that also, but I will spare you all details. Then we looked at uh, N100 topography, and you see for both right and left index finger, there's no much change in the negative and the positive peaks with the micro voltages next to that. So there's no uh, differences between that. The circles are indicating the standard error of the mean. Now this is interesting for the N200 topography. Uh, we see that if a uh, right index response is made, the negativity is over the left hemisphere, and when a left index response is made, the, right, the negativity is over the right hemisphere. And to show you the same thing with the uh, uh, voltage maps together, you see here the latencies also, which do not differ very much. You see when you have a right-hand response that uh, most negativity is over the left hemisphere and when you have the right the left hand response it is over the right hemisphere and this we found at w in the window of the n200 but we discussed this in the light of the presentation of this morning uh, what what did we measure here is this the pr uh, preparatory uh, response or is what 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 is this i don't know exactly it is perhaps not the normal n200 but it is false in the framework in the in the window of that so i am very We'll be happy to hear your response on that, your ideas on that. This is the, well, because of the light, I think, a P300 with the, the map with the maximum over here in the PZ area and the negativity in both frontal areas. And when you do source calculation on this, on the grand average of these 40 subjects, you find something foolish. You get something like this somewhere in the throat of somebody is another source of P3. So this can't be something right. So this must be a wrong calculation, <coughs> but not a wrong calculation of the program. This must be data of so many people together that gives you a, a wrong clue about uh, uh, the source. And we were very much interested, of course, uh, looking into the sources of, of P3, but we, I will show you these data later. But first of all, we continue with the normal values. I have here, uh, for the die hard amongst you, the numbers of latencies for the different paradigms we used, the left hand, right hand response and the counting, and the latencies and the amplitudes of the P3, positive amplitudes and negative amplitudes of all the components, N100, 200, and the P300. And so what we saw that is that when you do the counting, you get a complete, that, that only when in the counting response for the P3, you get a different, uh, different value, statistical different values from the motor responses. Now we designed also funny paradigms, as I told you before, because we are interested in, in our department in, or let's say I am interested in dyslexia. So I try to find a paradigm to uh, do a kind of P300 on children with dyslexia to find out if it would help us in making a diagnosis. But we, uh, well, it was difficult to do this. And what we, what we did is that we designed a computer program to make images and then we asked the children to push a button when uh, a right hand button when the image was not uh, something to dress with 
and the left hand button when they could dress with uh, the subject that they saw. So a cap or a dress or whatever, a shoe, left, index, left hand response and something else, right hand response. So in every case they should make a response. And then we also, after that, or before that it was at random, showed them the words. So first trial images, next trial the words. And we tried to do this first on normals and then we got some nice data and then we did it on the patients and it could be because of the age of the children or the fact that they are dyslectic and that they are making a lot of artifact anyway we got a lot of rubbish that I won't show it to you but what we found was interesting in normals this is the Apple computer to do this with and this is the image that should come up next yes this is for instance I put them on one slide together this is the, the target in which this could be uh, the, the only we show not the both of them, this is only for the matter of the, the slide here. Uh, you, they get only the, the code or the word for code, which is yes in Dutch. <coughs> so they made a response on that with the lift hand. So what we saw if we showed the, the words, we saw a pr prolonged left frontotemporal negativity over a long period and a positive area over the parietal uh, scalp region which gives you a clue if you look at sources for instance that there might be some activity in the left temporal area very interesting and when we showed them the pictures we s saw in not all the subjects but we in the normals that we get the same thing on the right side so this is very interesting and something perhaps that could be useful in, in, in the future for uh, if you know what to look at exactly to, to find out what happens with language processing. Now we go to patients and what I, perhaps this is wrong, but what I try to, to do is to find out sources of P300 by looking at patients and to see in certain lesions, localized lesions, or not so much localized lesions, what happens to P300? What? Because if you have a, perhaps a lesion somewhere and the P3 changes, you might learn something about a source that is influencing the P3. So I will show you now some patient data in which P3s are changed. Here you see a lesion, uh, this is CT, with uh, this data that I uh, happily could uh, publish together with uh, Nikos Triantafilo, a patient with a hemorrhage in the right caudate nucleus. And up to now the caudate nucleus was not a, never in the picture for a P3 source. But if you look at the source calculation for this P3 in this particular woman, you see that it is completely gone to the left side, that you don't get a normal midline P3 anymore. Very astonishing. You can say, well, there must be something more wrong in this brain or whatever. But if you look at these sources, and this is every time frame uh, between uh, about 290 to 200 uh, to 320 uh, milliseconds, you see that the P3 goes from the left frontal area or frontal temporal area to somewhere more temporal back. So that, must, that means that there must be a source for this activity reflecting P300 in one hemisphere, but in a, in, a, in a frontal area. And that means that also this caudate nucleus hemorrhage or lesion is responsible for this asymmetry, I think. Well, correct me if I'm wrong. Now we go to another lesion. This is a 29-year-old male nurse who attracted a syphilis and had a, a hemiparesis on the right side. And the strange thing was that we didn't know what he had before we uh, looked at the P300 because it was very strange, this, this I will tell you later. We made a CT, he comes in with a spastic hemiparesis, he comes in 
we make a CT is negative. His, his EEG is performed even with the frequency analysis is negative. Lumbar puncture shows cells. Very strange. So we, of course, if there is an augmentation of, of, of uh, cells in the CSF, we perform uh, Lewis tests and then it was positive. So we presumed he had a syphilitic, uh, a syphilitic uh, vasculitis, uh, perhaps cortical, small vessels, and we treated him with uh, penicillin and he recovered a little bit, but not completely. But the P3 we performed in this guy shows you a very strange topography, which is completely abnormal. And this was neurophysiological measurement that was the only abnormality found in this patient. So this is something else that you see that a non-structural lesion that does something perhaps in the cortical areas changes P300. Perhaps another source. Here we have a boy of nine year olds who had a subdural empyema on the right side. And what you see is his EEG, which shows on the uh, over, uh, it was on the left side. And you see over the, the left side here, uh, am I wrong yet? No, no, uh, it was on the right side, of course. And here you see the slow waves, which higher amplitude on the left and with. Uh, low amplitude on the right and you see here the, the typical zeta waves which were described by Otto Magnus when you can suspect from the EEG uh, an uh, MPA or a, an hemorrhage. So here we know that there is a functional disturbance of the cortex also due to compression and we see the P300 is nicely present, 